So, good morning, Pierre. Good morning. Welcome in Antwerp. Thank you very much. Uh, can you give us a little introduction about yourself? Uh, okay, so I'm Pierre Arnaud Le Magnon. I'm 54 years old, uh, raised and born in France, studied in France. Then, uh, uh, actually never worked in France because uh, my internship was in the US and then afterwards uh, Military service in the New Caledonia, in the islands, you know, I'm, I have a, a background as well, more in, uh, in sailing, windsurfing and so on. Um, and um, after that, I uh, worked straight in uh, Hong Kong, in Asia, as a first experience. And I've been there for 27 years. So, yeah, almost uh, half of my life, actually, okay. yeah, is, uh, is been in Asia. So, of course, I commute back and forth to, to Europe. Uh, so I have an engineering degree in design, industrial design and material. And I come in a family where we are all engineers. So uh, we have workshops at home. I built my first windsurf board in carbon fiber when I was 13 years old. So uh, I, I worked also my hands on steel welding when I was 14 and these kind of things. So yeah, the, 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 the environment I would say is very uh, technical and do-it-yourself uh, and uh, also uh, very much focused uh, as well on innovation because my, my father created some research center in France uh, for, for innovation in materials uh, linked. Uh, they worked with uh, Airbus, with uh, Renault Formula One engines, you know, this kind of top-end thing. So I've, maybe that's why I'm doing things this way today, but it has some uh, reasons and some roots somewhere, which is in my family, yeah. Why did you start with, with Chiro bikes? Uh, actually, I've always, when I'm deep into a, a sport and, and since I'm eight years old, I, I, I'm doing competition in sailing when I was in national team, uh, when I in my youth and uh, uh, later on combined with my will to design the, the, the products and build them. Uh, I, I, I started to do that for windsurfing and uh, after for kitesurf, uh, but when I started uh, also to be more deep into uh, biking, uh, in, especially in adventure racing, I wanted to design bikes uh, that uh, are fitting my, my requirements and more as also an exploration, uh, you know, in, uh, uh, for, for my own culture is I always like to build the toys I'm going to be using in my sport. Uh, and um, so I've started to, to make bikes for me and my friends in, uh, in scandium, in aluminium, uh, since maybe 2005, something like that. And uh, in uh, 2009, I, I decided to, to set up a brand because there was some opportunity and I was looking to diversify my, my activities. And I thought that would be a good idea to get uh, some bikes specifically designed for adventure racing, which is actually maybe the ancestor a little bit of the bikepacking uh, spirit. I mean, we have touring as the ancestor of bikepacking uh, and is still existing today, actually, but the source maybe is right there. But I think what uh, uh, attracted me in the adventure racing was the fact that you go really for, for, for the adventure. It's not anymore the format where you follow signs and you're just like physically training and these kind of things. There's also another dimension to it, which is unknown. And this is really what I like and that keeps me going in my sports. So yeah, it made sense to me to, when I discovered adventure racing, to go also fully into it. So that's a bit the reason uh, that led me to create Chiru. And since the beginning, we were maybe doing already ultra endurance, but in multi sports and in team, because those races can be uh, like five days, six days, 800 kilometers in running, kayaking, biking, uh, caving, upsailing, anything. And uh, basically, uh, bikepacking, you same thing, but you just take out all the other activities and focus on one. So it's actually way easier than doing multi sport adventure racing, which is in team of four. So always put together four people is also not necessarily the easiest thing in the world. It's super fun, but there's a lot of constraints in it, for sure. When did you start with Churro bikes? 
Hello, I started uh, to name my activity in making bikes in 2009 as Chiro Bikes. Um, but I really started to make bicycles in 2005 somehow under like no brand or just a little name like that. And uh, after that, when I decided to launch it as an official business in a brand, uh, I also researched the, uh, the name that would, you know, um, would inspire, have the same vision as what we have in uh, uh, Ultra Endurance, okay? Uh, and so I named it Chiru. Uh, the story is uh, they're, they're, it's, a, it's an antelope from Tibet, which is an endangered species. And uh, there's been a movie uh, that I watched just by luck like that called Kuku Shili, The Mountain Patrol, which is a story of some Tibetan guys who organized themselves as a protection brigade, maybe the <laughs> Chiru brigade almost already, uh, who uh, are trying to protect the animal from the poachers. Uh, and so uh, the, the animals need to be killed to get the wool from it. And from that, uh, the chatouche wool is produced and uh, the, the, the animal uh, reserve was like almost depleted like 20 years ago from half a million at the beginning of the century. And um, this movie managed to put some light onto this, the trade on this animal push the Chinese government to do something officially, that means uh, organize and uh, put a budget into the protection of the animal. And uh, the director, who was a Chinese director, managed to do that by creating this movie. So I found that story very uh, inspiring. And the animal is also very inspiring in terms of uh, its habitat, because they, the, the, the Chiro lives at, uh, on a Tibetan plateau at four or 5,000 meter elevation. Uh, it's quite a difficult area to live, so you have very scarce water, uh, it's cold, everything, so that the animal runs also pretty fast and in very endurance. So that's, that's really close to what we are doing when we are bikepacking in wild places. We, we need to have the qualities that the, the Chiru has. So I found that like talking about this animal to uh, let the people know never buy chatouche wool, which is the wool coming from the Chiru that you buy from India, because actually the skins are sent to India and turned into wool and woven over there, uh, was also something that's important for me uh, to, to try to let the people know that. Okay, so that's, that's about the, the time when I created the, the brand and the story behind the name in a way, yes. Why did you choose titanium to build your bikes in? Alors, at the beginning, we didn't choose uh, titanium. I uh, played with many materials, so as I was mentioning, uh, scandium. Uh, when we started with Chiru, uh, we started with carbon fiber, uh, and we built bikes in carbon fiber for like uh, six years, something like that, uh, six, seven years. And uh, so carbon is great, you can do a lot of things, you have a lot of freedom with it to, uh, to, to give some kind of uh, character and characteristic to, to a frame uh, by uh, orientating the frame, by uh, working on your cross sections and everything. Uh, so that's what we did with uh, our first uh, uh, hardtail, as we say, which six months after we became world champion in adventure racing with that bike. And uh, that was a hardtail with a lot of vertical compliance, passive vertical compliance. So we tried to do a a carbon bike very comfortable as much as we can. So still performance, that means good uh, stiffness in torsion and lateral flexion, but uh, good vertical compliance. And actually it worked well, but we found out as well that uh, the frames get worn out much, much quicker than uh, any metal frames. Uh, you know, especially when you do adventure racing, you put bags on them, you go through muds, you really like, give them a, a bad, bad time, you know, <laughs> it's, it's pretty harsh for the bikes. And um, also one of the key points is that on full rigid bike, uh, it's pretty hard to have something very comfortable that filtrates vibrations or small shock uh, with carbon. It's possible to make them better, sure, than the regular, but there is some limit to it. And uh, when uh, I tried to push my, uh, 
my quest of you know more fight comfort, more 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 soft touch when you ride a bike. Uh, definitely, titanium was the material that could um, actually help for this uh, particular point. Uh, and actually, it's also a material that uh, today can last a long time. So compared to carbon, the lifespan of a titanium bike has nothing to compare. Um, especially that in terms of the surface, uh, you can bring it back to its new condition just with a scotch bright and polish it. It takes you an hour. And we designed our bikes in, with this in our mind by putting laser logo so that you can brush over. If you, we used to have a sandblasting finish in some areas. Once you do a scratch, it needs to go back to the factory. That's not the same budget at all. So uh, we had this in mind, which was important. Uh, and, but as well, the uh, mechanical characteristic and behavior. That means titanium works well with fatigue. So uh, you, you, you can have the frames that last longer, but the properties disappear. Uh, for some material, that's the, the case. The fatigue is not really, really, performance not really good. With titanium, we've got that. So uh, today, we, our bikes are lifetime warranted. Uh, and uh, they, throughout their life, they keep their performance as well. So in the new way of consuming that we have today, all the consciousness that we as human beings have towards the use of our um, resources on the planet, uh, I think titanium uh, uh, sits really well into a, a material that's worth investing in. So, and I say investment, I didn't say buy because I, I see it as an investment. Yes, it's more expensive than any other bike later, but it doesn't rust. It's lifetime warranted. Uh, you're gonna, the service that's the characteristic of the bike is gonna keep through life. And so no other material can do that. So it's a little bit like when you compare a regular transmission with a gearbox, like pinion or whatever. Yes, it's expensive when you buy it, but uh, when you have to do an uh, oil change only every 10,000 kilometers and your gig box can do way more, uh, in the end, when you compare with regular chain and drive, it's, uh, not this, it's cheaper in the end. It's cheaper. So, but that's, that's a different mindset as a consumer that you need to get. So where that for us linked with the, the properties also for performance that you can get and uh, mechanical characteristic in terms of dampening vibrations and shocks and everything made it the material to, 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 do, to do our bike. Uh, and that's why today we focus 100% uh, on that. How do the Chiro frames differ from other titanium bike frames? Okay. Uh, alors, first, Chiro is bikepacking uh, specific, uh, but uh, bikepacking performance. That's where maybe we, we, we are maybe different from, uh, from others. That means really we are still looking at having a bike which is uh, uh, bringing you a lot of uh, uh, comfort uh, and power transfer in order to uh, actually uh, travel faster. There is still this in mind, is to uh, uh, this objective of uh, being able to, uh, to, to perform or to travel fast. Uh, because we, we come from a background of uh, racing and these kind of things. Although I think even when I'm not racing uh, or in a racing mood or whatsoever, or trying to push myself, uh, which is more the definition of bikepacking, we don't race against other people, you race against yourself. But even when you go touring like that, you like to have a bike that performs and that you think, oh, otherwise you're going to say, oh, if I had another bike that's uh, a little bit lighter or a little bit more power transfer uh, competitive, then I would climb faster or it would be easier. I don't want to have this in my mind. So I want to make sure that when I'm sitting on my bike and uh, going away uh, riding, that I'm on the best possible bike I could have because I ride and I still ride on bikepacking competitively and this kind of thing, so, or, or go for a long ride. So I, my quest is always to have the best bike for what I'm doing. So um, the bikes are specific so for bikepacking in terms of, uh, yes, all the model line we have. We now have uh, 
uh, with the new models we're going to launch next year, we'll have 13 models specific for bikepacking. So that's quite a big range from road to a trail uh, for mountain. Uh, and um, of course, everything is compliant and uh, ready for bag installation. So bolt on bags for, for frames. So you don't have to fiddle with Velcros and everything, leave marks on your frame. You can have an, a neat setup. Same thing for lighting, same thing for as well uh, the routing. So we're compliant with mechanical, with uh, DI2, with of course AXS. Uh, but you can also choose on each frame if you want to have a full internal routing, uh, semi internal in the down tube, external on the, the, the base, on the rear triangle, or fully external. So that's really very versatile uh, compared to what you want to do. If you want to keep everything outside for easier maintenance or whatever, you can do it because it can be a pain sometimes to go through the frame. Uh, of course, easier to dismantle. So we don't go full internal cable routing because you can't really take out your, your handlebar, uh, these kind of things. We can do it, but uh, for the moment we don't because it's too, it's too complicated to travel with. Um, and I would say, uh, if we talk now more about the, the design of the bikes itself, I think the key point what differentiates us from any other brand is that the, the, none of our tubes are round. We have a process where all our tubes are either uh, cold form or hot formed or hydro formed. And this has been done in the same a bit spirit as when I was designing carbon frames, when, where we work on the cross section of the frame. Uh, titanium is a isotropic material, so it's, it's the, the performance and the characteristic are the same as any direction, which is not the case in carbon. So that in carbon, you have one more things to play with. But uh, here, you still can work with the, the cross section of, the, um, of the, 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 the tubes on the frame and all, also the, the, the connections and everything. So there, there's a lot of uh, uh, work and engineering into what we've put just to try to improve uh, the performance of the frame in terms of power transfer, but also in terms of comfort. So vibration dampening and shock absorption as, uh, as much as we can. Because more, more comfort in bikepacking in long distance equals performance. Because uh, the, the, the body, the muscles of the body, after seven, eight hours uh, of, uh, of activity, uh, you start to get uh, tired and everything. And the performance itself of the muscles would decrease for, with many, many reasons. One of it is vibrations. So if you, you put your body through a lot of vibrations, you'll get tired much quicker, sore muscles, less performance in the muscles, and so on. So for long distance, really, uh, vibration dampening is key to being able to pedal longer and at a better level of, uh, of efficiency. So, so that's really a focus we have uh, on, on, the, on the brand. Um, and maybe another point that uh, makes uh, Chiru different from other brands is that uh, it's a very small brand. It's basically me. And uh, I, I follow uh, my, my philosophy in, in four words is dream, design, craft, ride. Uh, so I would dream about going somewhere or doing a race or whatever. I would design a frame, a bike for it. Uh, I will have it built and I will ride the race this event for it and test it. And while I'm doing the race, I would do my debrief on what I like, what I don't like. You know, you have a lot of time. Sometimes in backpacking, you can register <laughs> your feelings and, and so on. And when I would come back, I would debrief and, uh, and uh, the, the, the put the bike into, into production uh, afterwards and, and launch it. So that was the case for a lot of our bikes, like the, the KGT you see behind in the Silk Road mountain race it was designed for that. And uh, we've uh, done since 2018 uh, four evolution about. And now I think we're close to what we exactly want. So sometimes it takes more than one edition. Uh, and, um, but but sometimes we get it more straight, like some bikes are, didn't have that much evolution because they're more 
uh, more into the spot of what we wanted from the from the start. But uh, yes, now we're closer <laughs> to that. Do you also offer titanium forks? Alors, yes, we do uh, titanium forks. Uh, it was a project that took us uh, two years to come with something that works. Uh, the idea was to get, you know, the, the vibrations actually in a bike enters from the fork. That's why when you put a, a 100 millimeter suspension or travel fork on a bike, immediately it's a, it's a big, big improvement. So uh, I followed and researched because I was also into uh, selling bikes uh, at some point with our company, with some brand who made a lot of development into uh, putting a damper inside the rigid forks. And uh, so that really also attracted my eyes to say, yeah, that's really a point that we need to improve as well, where there is a lot of things to be done. So everybody has its own solution. You have Lauf, who came with a, a kind of a suspension with carbon blades and everything. Uh, for us, it's more trying to use the properties of the, the titanium uh, to try to deliver a more plush ride and uh, also accurate ride. So uh, the traditional titanium fork uh, with, you know, truss construction and just like you see a steel fork, for titanium, it's very hard to make them work in this way. That's why you don't see many. So we had to, to find a new technology, which uh, we have, uh, that uh, make the fork look like uh, a carbon fork from the outside. If I paint it in black and I give it to you, you would say, oh, that's carbon fork. Yeah, no, it's titanium. So it's, it's not easy to make uh, a product in titanium look like a product which is molded in carbon because it's all shapes that are uh, 3D generated and so on. So uh, the, the idea at the beginning was, of course, to get the uh, properties we needed. And that led us to a, a technology that uh, uh, makes the fork look like uh, uh, a carbon fork, I would say, in terms of the shape. So it's more also elegant. We have more freedom into the, uh, the shapes, I would say, for aesthetic. But the, the primary goal was to get uh, the stiffness where we needed to get it in order to get uh, good braking uh, performance and remove the vibration from the braking phase. And also uh, to have all, uh, the performance in, uh, in steering, you know, the lateral rigidity and, and, and so on. And today, uh, some of the riders who have it, they say they even feel like on the road bike, for example, that the fork is better than a carbon fork that they had before. So it's, it's smoother, but it's also more accurate, uh, more stiffness into it, but stiffness in terms of the steering, not into the, the, the feeling. Uh, of the, the vibrations, so that's that's I think quite a good uh, a good development. We are just at the beginning of uh, putting the product into the market, and um, right now we can put it on all our rigid uh, frames, like from road, I would say, to uh, uh, titanium mountain bike for long distance that you can ride rigid, for example. So we, it's uh, it's now. Uh, tested and works on this and we have it in all different lengths for all uh, road bike, gravel bike and uh, mountain bike I would say uh, for 100 millimeter corrected length of, uh, of travel. Um, and the great thing as well is the accessory possibilities that you can put because it's totally hollow inside. Uh, you can uh, route all your wires, especially for the dynamo, uh, with an exit point at the top of the crown, but also uh, inside the, the steering tube where you can connect a battery charger and a cash battery and all these kind of things. And if uh, uh, at some point we need to put more inserts or whatever, it's super easy to do. So that's, uh, I mean, in terms of flexibility, because it doesn't involve a new tooling like a carbon fork would. Uh, when you put inserts somewhere. Um, and the additional weight is not that much. We're talking 150 to 200 grams compared to a carbon fork. So that's not much. You don't really feel it. And the benefit is above the, the, the additional weight that you could have uh, when you're doing long distance or even in a 
I ride also my bike every day and I find it's, it's, really, it's really good. I love it. Yeah. I actually don't like to go back on carbon forks after, after that. It's like I ride only the titanium one. Yeah. I saw on your website that the frames are divided into uh, different activity categories. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us more about that? Yes, so we would have more uh, category, uh, category with uh, road and uh, all road. Okay, so that, that would be uh, in terms of uh, uh, design and access, uh, road and bad roads and all road, we start to get into light gravel, I would say, like the, the Chilkut model, where you can fit tires up to 40 mil. So that's really, uh, uh, for some countries, it's already big tires and really, really gravel. And for some, it's like way not enough. Um, and then after we have the, the gravel segment, I would say, uh, more with some bikes for adventure, a new bike for alpine uh, gravel environment. Uh, and the monster gravel, which uh, like the KGT and uh, another new bike that will launch in 2023 are across uh, the gravel segment and what we call the bike packing segment. Bike packing segment would be bikes where uh, the, the geometry and the size of the tires will uh, help you to tackle longer distance, longer adventure. In, in longer adventure, what we found, when you get uh, to it with tires which are too small in volume, because we should never forget that the tires have the first suspension and vibration damper on a, on a bike. After, if you follow, you have the rim that also can play. You can have a very stiff rim or a soft one. You have also the spoke, okay, that works. You have the fork, you have the frame, you have the seat post, you have the saddle. Okay, so all this way through, and you have the handlebar, which is really important, and where we designed as well a specific handlebar for vibration dampening and shock dampening, which we're really happy with. It's for me, it's a, also a good blessing because I've got problems with my, my, my nerves here, we've got compressed. That's one also the problem we can have in bikepacking uh, races. If you put your hands too much in one position for long hours, you have some risk of uh, injuries. So, of course, I injured myself and uh, it, it stayed there every time now. If I've got something set up that is not well designed, I'm in pain very quickly after 10 hours, 20 hours or something like that of riding. Um, so, yeah, bikepacking, we, I think that the volume of tires is pretty important to first give you comfort, but also sometimes speed. Like if you go through terrain, which is a little bit harsh with potholes or small rocks or whatsoever, uh, if you ride uh, with small tires, you need to ride with a certain high pressure. Okay, so your tire will not deform. Every time your tire does not deform and there's a micro small obstacles on the road, it's a micro stop, micro break. It's, and you can't go really fast. So we've done a lot of testing on that. Uh, as soon as the terrain becomes a little bit rough, you're way better with a bigger tire and a lower pressure. After the nobbies and everything, that's another story. Uh, but uh, you actually go faster on this kind of terrain. Uh, it's a bit counterintuitive uh, for if you come from the road biking, everything. But if you come from the mountain bike, you kind of already know that. And uh, so the, the bikepacking uh, bikes, I think it's quite important to, to focus also on the comfort. And uh, well, we focus on performance as well, but like bigger tires, bigger volume tires are uh, pulling us into that direction. That's why a lot of our bikepacking uh, bikes have a big tire clearance because we want to be able to fit big tire or regular tire with a lot of mud clearance as well. Uh, but uh, after, after a certain level, you can't go too high. We see the trends in the US. Uh, I used to do bikes with a 3.0 in size. Yeah, it's nice. It's super plush, super comfy, really nice. But when you have long climbs with 3.0, the weight of the tires is just massive. The rims as well need to be bigger and everything. And uh, sometimes the offset in performance starts to be too much. So. There's really a limit to that, which I put around 2.6. Uh, that over 2.6, you start really to have some things that's a bit too heavy for my liking. Uh, so you can compensate with smaller knobs. So that means you get less 
friction and a better performance. But uh, yeah, I would say going up to 2.6, which, which is big already. It's already pretty big, depending on what terrain you go. But uh, I rode the 2.6 on the Highland Trail in Scotland. And uh, on the technical section, it was just great. It was really, really nice on the hardtail with 120 millimeter trouble. So that's... How long does it take to uh, develop a frame? A frame? Uh, well, I would say uh, it's, it's, it's nearly a year. It could be, if you put all the stage, including the testing and everything, it's some time and, and getting the first batch of production and everything, which is a challenge at the moment. Uh, it would be like closer to two years. Uh, the fork was two years. Uh, in some frame at the beginning when we did, it was like six months or four months to get, uh, to get it down and everything and rolling. So yeah, it, can, it depends on the uh, environment and the timing and everything. But basically, yeah, in average, it would take a year basically getting from and also the, 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 the thinking over it, I would maybe have the idea and start design later, you know, when I have the feeling I need another bike in this range, which uh, I think there's too much difference between two models. And I think there would be a spot for another one, which, you know, with 13 models for a small brand like me, it's, it's already too much in a way, but that's me. I like to design bikes. That's what excites me more than uh, uh, other things. So uh, I, I really like to have a, a bike which has a small difference and that would uh, perform differently in this kind of environment. And I realized also in the different market we are selling, people are, are different demands. The terrain is different. The way they practice the, their bikepacking is also different and so on. So maybe in some countries only three models would match the requirement from the population right there. And in another country, it would be three different other models. So that's also me, I think, nice to be able to offer solutions for, for everybody who are looking for proper solutions for their bikepacking things because we are bikepacking specialists. So our aim is to be able to deliver, to offer uh, the one solution for anybody, really, uh, that's into uh, performance bikepacking. Uh, no matter they ride on the road or they ride in the mountain. So, yeah. Can you walk us through the design process from start to end? You already more or less answered that uh, yeah. before, but maybe just concentrated yes. on, on... Oh, okay. So, yeah, I would, I would think over quite a long time about the ideas, the design. I would do some small sketch, uh, some concept uh, on my side, not sharing with uh, the factory or engineers or anybody. Uh, and trying to, to, to validate the, the concepts in, in my head that it is something that's worth it and that makes sense in terms of, uh, you know, the type of transmission you fit on it, the standard, the tires, the geometry, the, the sloping of the frame or not, uh, some technical solutions for, uh, for, for the bottom bracket or the dropout or these kind of things. Then I would uh, do a, a 2D drawing a concept with the geometry for the size and then uh, we would make a first prototype uh, with the, uh, the drawings and so on that I validate with the engineer who draws it uh, in 3D also sometime we have to look into uh, some parts in 3D and also 3D printing to validate some point where we're not sure and we want to see it sometimes the feeling is different and the reaction and so on because I try to push the boundaries, for example, in, from uh, the interface between the crank uh, and, uh, and the chainstay and the tire, you know, there's a zone just like behind the chain ring where it's really, really tight um, and you have a lot of constraint right there. And then my target is always to try to have the maximum tire with the biggest range of chain rings. So I, I've gone into some testing also of new concept and so on that sometime we will test it as the prototype i will show you we have one uh, that we we won't use we tested something but we won't use it at some point but uh, basically yeah doing the prototype riding it in the race usually um, and uh, after that uh, debrief modify the drawing okay and launch the the production okay 
and then uh, start to uh, to promote it uh, after afterwards. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's a. It could be as I said to you, like these stages can happen in six months, to maybe a year or more generally, something like that. Um, uh, free, yeah. The 3D on some frames have been really helpful, especially for our trail bike, which is more complex because you have a full suspension. So, uh, yeah, we've been using also this kind of, uh, of technology as well. Yeah. Yes. Did you offer a series of frames for different activities from the beginning of your company or did you slightly build it up? Mm. Over the years? Uh, yes, it went by stages. So first, in the same way in the, uh, when we were doing carbon bikes, we started with a, a hardtail and full suspension in 26 inch at, the, at that time. And then after we started to propose a 29 hardtail and after 29 full suspension and a 29 full suspension down country and so on. So yeah, it's always going by stage. It's a bit the same here uh, because it takes time. You cannot do uh, like so many races or tests uh, in a year. Um, so yeah, we started with the divider pinion for in 2017. Actually, the start of this idea started in 2016. Uh, so I still had carbon frames at the moment, but I wanted to push the titanium and, and test the market and uh, for this specific bike packing and. Uh, that was the first year, and after every year, I added one or sometimes two models. Uh, next year, we're gonna launch four models. Yes, because thanks to COVID, uh, those models are ready since two years already. In the on the drawing board and the prototype, the prototype of the Alpine right there. I've been riding it for more than a year, uh, which but because I needed to give priority in production to the regular models, uh, this one had to wait. So, but usually yeah, we managed to do one to two bikes per, per year and, uh, and we're going to get slower a little bit because 13 model is already a lot. So I have already in mind the next model for the number 14, but <laughs> it's, it's going to take a bit more time. It's, it's already in my head, but uh, I, I have other priorities. Yes. <laughs> okay. So are, are you going to skip some models if you're going to are you, have, do you have a number in your head? Like we won't get more than, or we, no. No. no and it's no. possible in production, yes? Yeah, it's possible in production because with, with titanium, you can uh, actually uh, have, um, you don't need to launch big batch, I would say. Uh, the tooling, we have some investment in some toolings, but we use them on all our bikes somehow. It's not a dedicated mold per size and per model. So that's easier also, titanium allows you to do that. Um, but uh, no, I never asked myself the question, should I limit myself with a quantity or whatever? I don't know, I'll see. Um, if really at some point we see that some model doesn't sell at all, uh, yes, maybe we'll stop. Or if we want to have less stock or rationalization, maybe what we'll do is that we won't have stock, but they will be made upon order. Well, actually, it's already the case with pinion bikes. So uh, two of our models for bikepacking, the KGT and the Divider, are uh, available also with pinion gearbox. But this, the demand is not as regular as traditional uh, transmission. And so we do them uh, upon order. So you still can keep a model in your catalog and uh, make it on order. It's not necessarily a big burden for the company. Uh, in terms of the, the, the running the business. So um, after some models could evolve as well. That means if it doesn't sell or if it's uh, outdated, uh, we'll update them. And uh, so far we've been updating the models every year because every time I get a comment from somebody like ah, maybe we could change like this or that or there's also a new standard coming. Like all our frames, except the road bike, are equipped with the SRAM UDH hanger, which is the, a, a new standard with uh, this kind of hanger that brings actually more function. But uh, actually the new derailleur that SRAM is going to bring out next year, it will be only compatible with SRAM UDH hanger. 
So a lot of companies have changed this year their, their frames to be compatible with SRAM UDH hanger. I've done that two years ago already. So I was a bit in advance on that because of the functionalities that there is in this hanger, which was interesting for us. Uh, but actually the brands are going to push you to use it in a way. So I'm happy I took the decision without the constraint from the brand for some real functional technical reasons. But uh, yeah, we'll have to do some evolution in, uh, in the future on some models. And uh, I think the development as well um, pushes uh, us by designer to always try to bring something new or different. Uh, Sometimes you bring something different and it doesn't work. Sometimes it's too early, it's not the timing. I've got some bikes on the drawing boards that I didn't take out because I think it's too early and some people did it and it didn't work. So we'll wait or refine, retune the concept so that it can work. Uh, I was one of the first ones to offer in production a mulet bike, 29-27. We started to do that in 2013 on mountain bike. No interest. Uh, it was on hardtail and uh, started full suspension. But now today you see in the enduro scene uh, that uh, a lot of people love to ride like this. It's, it has an advantage. I mean, it gives some certain riding capabilities and uh, things. But so, yeah, it really depends the timing. So we'll see. Maybe 20 models. I don't know. But I hope not. <laughs> it will be too difficult to manage. I hope less, maybe. <laughs> Where did you get the expertise to build bicycle frames? Okay, well actually there is no school to learn to build bicycle frames. So I think uh, people who design, uh, build bicycle frames have all different background. I think uh, you, what's interesting is that you, 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 depending on your background, you would put different things, different way of designing it or thinking it. After, of course, there is some standard in the industry, you need to follow in terms of either the construction or the standard you need to respect for the, 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 the components and so on. But for the, the con making the bike, it's also a different uh, technology, I would say, that you can use. But basically, I learned by myself, you know, uh, experimenting uh, by building your first bike, looking what's there. Mm getting inspiration also from uh, what's happening on the market and so on. So, you know, being on the bike shows, I exhibit on the bike shows, but I always like to go around to see. And there's always something that, uh, you know, uh, astonishing. Where people have like designed something which is uh, different and so on. And that inspires you to keep also on your side, to keep developing and uh, propose some solution which are out of the box, but that solves a problem. Uh, that's the case, for example, for our handlebar. We, we the straight, the flat handlebar now what, that, that you can see behind that uh, is very comfortable. Uh, is something I have in my mind since three or four years, how to solve, how to add vibration dampening right there. And so I tested different solution uh, that worked more or less better and came out with this solution, which is super simple, light and efficient. Uh, so sometimes it takes some iteration to, 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 to keep looking, innovating and, uh, and, uh, yeah, and design new things. But basically, yeah, I learned by myself to design the bikes and uh, I didn't work for a big company who design, uh, who make bikes. Same, the engineer who design the bikes are either mechanical engineer, uh, industrial design. Uh, me, I studied material and industrial design, so yeah, it's the same. It's just I did it for myself instead of doing it for other people in the beginning. Yeah. Do you only offer frames or also complete uh, build bikes? We mostly offer frames at this stage. Uh, in the past, at the beginning, we started to offer complete bikes. But uh, it's, it's pretty difficult to, to offer that. And we are shipping all across the world. It's complicated. It's really complicated. Uh, today, uh, we're already busy enough uh, with uh, s uh, selling the frames. And I think today the beauty of it when you have a titanium frame is to make it unique. 
So building a bike in a unique way according to your budget, your taste, your requirements, uh, it takes also another stage into the process to have somebody who is equipped, who have the uh, uh, advice to uh, give you the, the, send you in the right direction in the choices of the peripherics or the transmission or these kind of things. Some people do it themselves because they know exactly what they want, they have experience, perfect. So they buy the frame and build it sometime themselves. They have the skills to do that. And some other people would go to a specialist who uh, is used uh, to uh, build bikes and offer, uh, propose different components to their clients. And I think that's really nice compared to uh, buying a complete bike uh, because when you pull it out of the box, but there is some tires you may like or not. A saddle, you may like it or not. The grips, you may like them or not. The handlebar, you may like it or not. There's a lot of things to change that basically are going to not end up in the bin, but you might use, you might resell or whatever. But in the end, uh, with a bike custom built, you get exactly what you want from the beginning. And uh, you have all those uh, options uh, to customize uh, with, uh, I would say, uh, specific parts in terms of the colors as well. Uh, our frame has been made even in the, the design, how it looks with our small logo in, uh, in laser hatching. Uh, they are not only durable, but also you can match it with any color you want. And that's the beauty of titanium. We see a lot of titanium bike painted now for some part of it. Sure, it's super sexy, very beautiful, but paint will scratch. When it scratch, you need to send it back to painting shop to repair it again or whatsoever. With uh, titanium, a little bit of uh, scotch bright, and your bike is new again. So uh, for me, for my vision, or at least for, for Chiru, I think customizing and making your bike sexy comes from the accessories. So you can pimp your ride in a way uh, with some uh, beautiful brands who do uh, anodizing and uh, I've seen some of my clients uh, who've built bikes for their customers and they've done a fantastic job. It's super, super exciting. No painting has been used, but it's just choosing the right components, combining the colors. You've got also, you know, the, the bar tape colors that can play, the saddle, all this, everything. You can play with leather as well. I've done my bike, uh, my personal road bike with a, a leather saddle, which is a regular saddle, but covered with, with leather, specific leather. Same for the bar tape and this kind of thing. So you can really give a, a touch, which is uh, still minimalist in a way, uh, but uh, in terms of uh, trend, uh, it will not get really easy out of the trend because it's not uh, a super strong colors that you put right there. So it's still into the idea of making your bike uh, to, to, to last. And if you're bored of your components, the color or whatever, you just change the components. You keep the frame the same way as it is, or you, you sell it and uh, the next guy will build it maybe a, a different way or whatever. So I find this solution to be, uh, I would say, uh, that what gives more freedom to the people. If they want to paint their titanium frame, we've done that for some clients. It's okay. I've done one for myself. And after six months, I was like, yeah, it's, I need to be too careful on the bike. There's scratch on the paint, there's everything. It's not for me, it's not for bike packing. If you don't do too much bike packing, then yeah, you can paint it and have a sexy titanium painted frame. But if you're doing bike packing, I think, and the beauty of the titanium, you know, with the, 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 um, the reflect of the light was changing depending on the time of the day or the orientation of the light. And it's, I think it's still very beautiful, especially when you have uh, we play with the shapes, that means we have nothing really around, so the, the light catches in a different way. So I think the, the beauty of the frame is also, uh, of the design, is also revealed by the, the reflection of the light on it. And uh, you could, I think, spend days to take pictures, uh, you know, artistic pictures from details on the titanium bikes and playing with the light. It's endless. You can do so many things. It's, it's really, really nice. So, yeah, painting it, it's beautiful. I, some bikes are just like, wow, but uh, that's not for me. <laughs>
So can you tell us a bit more about the Chiru Brigade? Yes, so Chiru Brigade uh, actually is, uh, it started when uh, I met uh, Kim Raymakers in the uh, Silk Road. Uh, we met during the race and uh, got into a friendship uh, after that around the, the bikepacking. And uh, I said there was also Ben Sturbo uh, that uh, also came uh, with, uh, with bike and had the same idea of how to do bikepacking and so on. And say, okay, let's you know ride together sometime and uh, uh, bring along our our sharing our, our way of bikepacking. And um, yeah, I wanted to call that not a team because we are not really a team. We have the the level of freedom that uh, we all want to uh, do any race we want and so on. But uh, we 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 have the same way of uh, of doing the the race or the race that we want to do. And we are all on the on the Chiro bikes, and uh, actually today it's also a, a, a word uh, to to. It's it's not really a, how to say kind of a team in, in in a way. It's more say I belong to the Chiro Brigade because that's the value I like. We have a tagline called Longer, Stronger, Faster, uh, which is what we do when we race. We try to race longer and still keep strong and uh, all the way through and finish fast and be faster in the end. So that's, that's a bit the, the tagline that we have right there. And some people recognize themselves also into that and uh, are welcome uh, in the Chiro Brigade, I would say. So uh, in uh, I think Chiro Brigades as well, it's also for me a uh, great help for the R&D. Uh, because uh, every time they're doing a race, of course, for me, I will follow them on the dots. You know, dot watching is like super exciting as well when you're not racing. And um, I'm maybe more stressed than them because I hope everything is going to be all right. Anything can happen on this kind of race. And uh, it's also I try to to have discussion with them on, hey, what, what do you think? How was the bike? How was your experience on that? Also during the race and so on. Any idea, any some things that bothered you or that we can change or whatever. And then that's also the, the feedback from them is really important uh, because sometimes I don't have the time to go on such race or test certain models so they would do it. And so for the close core Chiru Brigade, the Ultra Brigade, because they do ultra distance racing, uh, it's uh, also a very tight uh, exchange uh, for uh, for for the bikes, for the frame design and so on, to get uh, proper feedback and, and ideas as well. So that's, yeah, quite important. And some good friendship to go uh, and bike along together is also important. Yeah. Can you tell us a bit more about your collaboration with Thomas and Bikepacking Belgium? Yeah, so with Thomas uh, and Bikepacking Belgium, when I saw the name Bikepacking Belgium, oh, that's for me, <laughs> you know because we're about bikepacking. So it was pretty natural, I think, that we got uh, talking together and uh, to, to have Chiru uh, carried uh, right there in, uh, in Belgium and in all the Benelux uh, region. So yeah, it's, it's a bikepacking specialist. I think today uh, uh, having all the gear in a one-stop shop uh, is not very common because it's still very separated. Uh, my guess is that that kind of segment will develop because bikepacking is developing. And, uh, but it's good that uh, we found somebody that is uh, on, the, on, the, on the same page as us with the same segment and specification right there. Yes. So what will bring the near future for uh, Chiro bikes? Huh. Hard to say. Um, we'll have our new website launched because we've been uh, a bit lagging behind. <laughs> yes, Thomas will be super happy. Hopefully October. I hope this time it's the real time, uh, at least for the current models. The, the next models will come next year because they are not ready yet out of the production. So we'll launch them in stages. Uh, but yeah, hopefully have a, a better try to work a little bit more on our marketing. It's not my favorite thing. Um, I will prefer to be on my bike and designing rather than uh, spreading the, the news. Um, but, but yeah, I'll have to do that a little more. Uh, 
Today we are uh, more, our main market is still uh, in Europe, that means mostly France, a bit, yeah, so Benelux, uh, a bit Italy, um, a bit Switzerland, um, but uh, we want to expand um, a little bit more in, uh, in Europe. Some countries are very difficult to, to enter, it takes time, it takes dedication. Uh, but we are also in Asia, where we have like few countries. Uh, we are in New Zealand, um, hopefully soon in other countries as well in the region. And uh, getting back also, in, we were in the US with the stop of the components. I mean, the availability of the components being very difficult the last two years. It's been extremely challenging for the, the business model that was uh, of our partner right there. So they, they, they stopped it because it was impossible to continue to deliver. So we need to get restarted in North America um, with, with a partner there as well. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's the thing we are looking at. Uh, in terms of uh, the products, as I was telling you before, uh, I think we are with 13 models already quite having a wide range. My brain keeps designing other models and so on and the factory tells me calm down, <laughs> stop it. Uh, so, so yes, certainly there will be new models coming in the, in the years to fit some gaps somewhere. Um, maybe a, a road bike which is a little bit less bikepacking but Everybody also does or have a road bike right there, so it's not necessarily uh, really our our focus right there. But we we have a couple of things to 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 add uh, uh, models. Um, we are working as well on having uh, some kind of a test center in France to in the Alps, so that people can come and travel there to be able to test the bike and so on. Because that's also I found way better than uh, chatting uh, for hours about, yeah, it's better like this, like that. Just try the bike, see if you like it and uh, let us know, you know. And that's, I think, for a lot of consumers, it's a, it's a good way of, uh, you know, making their own mind uh, before, before buying. Um, and also we want to have a little bit more sharing with our customer base about the, the, the kind of... Uh, adventures that we can do so through some uh, actually some uh, some have some open uh, gpx file that some stuff where we test our bike or some of our models that are related to a models also helps to understand the people what's the model for in a way and uh, build up maybe a little bit some kind of community event on it so where we can go riding together at some time of the year, but you can also go and ride it whenever you want. And uh, it's with a certain model of bike to tell you, yeah, with on this type of... Today with 13 models, the problem is to explain to the people the difference of what each model is for. So we've created the chart to try to help the people but uh, so it's better, it's easier to understand, but you need also to have some kind of uh, projection in the terrain in real to see what's the bike for you know and that I think will give the people a better idea at what frame to choose some people have strictly no idea actually sometime on what they want to do they want to ride everything some kind of got I have guys who call me oh I want to do bike packing but I want to do also triathlon with the same bike uh, I say, yeah, it's possible, but it's not going to be good at bikepacking or not good at triathlon either, you know, it's just you know, take, take a city bike, you know, <laughs> whatever. <But laughs> uh, so, yeah, it's, I think it will help also for the people to, to find the different categories that there is in the or terrain in the bikepacking that, uh, you know, going onto the, the, the French divide with a gravel bike with 35 millimeter tires it's not going to be a lot of fun, you know. But a lot of people have been doing that at the beginning or, you know, still have in mind, hey, yeah, maybe I should do it or it would be faster. No, it's not faster. You need to go with at least 2.0 tires minimum or something and it's more mountain bike than anything else. So, yeah, it's, it's try to create more relationship between the activity and the, and the products so that uh, we, we, we can share and meet directly our 
the people who ride Chiro bikes, which is, I think, also for me important uh, to have people who, uh, with, to meet the people with whom we share the, the same bike, you know, and have the ideas and, uh, you know, they bring you sometimes some feedback. And uh, for me, it's also a big help to see how they see uh, bikepacking from their point of view. Because I have my own view, which is, as you understood, a bit more towards leaning towards performance and optimizations. But some other people, not necessarily, or in a different way. And that's also very, always rich to meet the people uh, and having this kind of discussions to, to see how they, they see things. And uh, you have even people who do their own bags or this kind of stuff. They have little ideas. I love that. You know, I love meeting people who do these kind of things. All right. So, yeah. We'll, we'll try to meet more people in the future uh, uh, through, through, through around the Chiro family, to grow the Chiro family, hopefully. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah.